There's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is recorded by Imam Bukhari and Muslim, where he said, he said, Ala kullukum ra'in, ala kullukum ra'in, wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyati, wa kama qala alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That all of you are a shepherd, and all of you are responsible, or literally will be questioned about your flock. So what is our flock? Certainly not our goats and chickens. The Urlama mentioned here, our flock is our intellect, our family, our limbs, the seven inroads to the heart, your eyes, your ears, your tongue, the uh, stomach, the genitals, the hands and the feet. These are your flock. To use a Ghazalian analogy, uh, these are the servants or the subjects of a kingdom, the Adith of a Mamlaka. And the purpose of these servants is to protect the king. The king is the heart, the qalb, the state of the heart. The state of the heart is the most valuable thing in your life. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim of the Prophet is reported to have said there is a mudha, there is a piece of flesh in the body that if it is sound, the entire body is sound. And if it is corrupt, the entire body is corrupt. The Prophet said, Indeed, it is the heart. About Ibrahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That Ibrahim السلام, he brought to his Lord a sound heart, a heart that is free of spiritual diseases. And there are many of these on Rad al Guru, and we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Tawfiq to help us to overcome these diseases. The major ones are kibr and hasad and riyah. And all of the, the root of all of these diseases, according to the Prophet وسلم, is hub dunya love of the world. Hub dunya ra'su kulli khatiyah. The love of the world, love of wealth, love of status, is the root to every sin. Seek wealth and status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The time is short, the affair is very serious, take your life very seriously. Ibn Akiba said that every name or title of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has three aspects that relate to his creation. And he called these ta'alluq, ta'khalluq, and ta'haqquq, or association, appropriation, and actualization. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al he is the king. Now what is our ta'alluq, what is our association to this name? is a recognition that he is the king and we are his subjects. We recognize that. There are people who don't recognize this. This is self-evident for us. It's axiomatic. For many people, it's not self-evident. They think they're the king of everything. Then what is our tachalluk? How do we appropriate or assimilate this name? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king of the universe, and we have to understand that we have to be king over our faculties, over our limbs. So we have to engage the spiritual path. And then when we reach our goal, this is called tahakkuk, this is called actualization. So in other words, the goal here, the telos of the human life is to mirror the divine names and attributes. This is the telos, this is the purpose of our life. As he did, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, faqad ja'akum rasulun min anfusikum. There is someone to you, a messenger from amongst yourselves. Aizisun alayhi ma alikum. It crushes him that you should perish. Hadisun alaykum, deeply covetous. Is he over you? Bin Mu'minina, Ra'uf al Rahim. To the believers, he is kind and merciful. These are two divine names, but without the definite oracles. To mirror the divine names and attributes. This is true in, in all of the Abrahamic traditions. This is Ghazali, this is Aquinas, this is Maimonides. A theological or teleological metaphysic, an, an end oriented or goal oriented metaphysic. So our metaphysicians, they've identified. Four causes of the creation of the human being. There are four causes of the creation of the human being. There's what's known as the efficient cause, which is the direct force of production. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is al fa'il He is the free agent, absolute volition according to his nature. al indatul fa'iliya, efficient cause. And then there's something called material cause. The stuff or material from which something is produced. What is the prime matter, the materia prima in Latin, for which the creation of the human being is produced? What is the prime matter? It's nothing. It's ex nihilo. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created from nothing. You were nothing, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. So there is no material cause to the creation of the human being. Now, modern science or Newtonian physics stops here. They only recognize the efficient and material causes. In other words, the entire universe, all of existence, is just matter in motion. This is a purely materialistic, mechanistic conception of existence. But our scholars continue. Traditional scholars of the Abrahamic tradition continue. There's a third cause of the human creation. Besides efficient and material causes, there's something called formal cause, which deals with the essence of what, of, of, of what is produced. What is it, essentially? It's quinity. It's mahia. It's whatness. What is the human being, essentially? Khalifatullah fil according to the Quran, the viceroy, the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the earth. Modern philosophers tend to be nominalistic. They deny essential natures. They deny human nature. This has led to a lack of objective morality. This has further led to massive skepticism and relativism. They say, well, if there's no human nature, what else did we get wrong? Right? So this has led to a distrust, a neutering of the aql, of the, of the intellect, human reason. Right? And finally, this has led to something called voluntarism, which is a strange philosophy which gives privacy to the will over the intellect. The will should never exceed the jurisdiction of the intellect. The purpose of the aql, of the intellect, is to keep the will, the desires, in check. The word aql, aql literally means this. When the Bedouin came into the masjid and his camel was running around outside, and the Prophet said, whose camel is this? And he said, that's my camel. I said, on Allah, I trust in Allah. The Prophet said, i'tilha fatawakkal ala Allah. Hobble her, hinder her first. This comes from the same root as the aql. The aql is supposed to control our will and desires, not the other way around. Otherwise, you have this philosophy of do whatever you want, not what is right, because we cannot know what is right. Right? This is what they say. We don't know. We can't know what is right. We can't trust our intellect. So do what you want. A worship of the nafs. A worship of the hawa, of desires and appetites. One of my teachers said recently, the Quran wants people to think deeply. That's why you have Juma Istikhaniya. You have interrogative questions in the Quran, which is a type of affective question. In Sha'iya. Ara'ita man ilahu hawa. Have you seen the one who has taken as his God, his hawa, his desires? This is very, very common. So there's a formal cause. And then finally you have a final cause, which in Arabic is called the Why is it? So the formal cause answers the question of what it is essentially. The, the final cause answers the question, why is it? Its purpose, its telos, the purpose of creation. The purpose of the creation of the human being is given explicitly in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and this ayah is in the first person singular, and there's a bad bad and there's an affirmation after negation, very strong rhetorical statement. In Imam al Bakhawi says, so the Quran says, in me, I did not create jinn or ins except the worship. Imam al Bakhawi says, and Ibn Abbas said, the meaning of that last part is, except to know me. But how do we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As we said, by associating, assimilating, or appropriating. And finally, actualizing the divine names and attributes to truly be representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the earth. To have iqtisam, to have a firm grasp of the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to have intiba, to have uh, adherence to imitation of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is our metaphysic. It recognizes human nature that is unique and dignified, goal-oriented, by contrast, the dominant epistemology in Western Academy, really around the world, colleges and universities, is something called postmodernism. We need to understand what this is and how to deal with it, or else this vidya will continue. This is a pandemic. You have Muslim students all around the world who are losing their religion when they go to college. This is very strange. Muslim students whose parents and grandparents were ulama and salihin and awliya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. We need to understand what this is. So postmodernism 
rejects ultimate or absolute truth with a capital T. There is no ultimate or absolute truth, they say. Right? You have to find your own subjective truths, lowercase t, plural. Live your truth, as they say. There is no true self in God's image to be actualized by disciplining your desires. You must invent your true self, self-invention by engaging your desires. Postmodernist philosophy is self-contradictory. And we have to be able to expose these contradictions. To say that there is no absolute truth is to make a statement that is absolutely true. In other words, they're saying the only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. Ajit logic. Postmodernists, they hate traditional value systems. They hate traditional religion. They deny objective morality. Morality is fluid and relative, they say. This is why traditional students, or religiously conventional students, in other words, Mu'minin, college uh, students that are Muslim, who believe in the Quran and Sunnah, they're so reluctant, even afraid at times, to take a theological or moral stance in a university classroom. To say, for example, that pantheism or incarnationalism is incorrect theology, or to say, for example, that homosexuality is sexually perverse, is to invite upon oneself a hailstorm of ad hominem epithets, such as close-minded, arrogant, ignorant, antiquated, dogmatic, bigoted, traditionalist. Postmodernists are dogmatically opposed to dogma. So for many of these young believers, there are only two viable solutions in their minds, either to sell out or to cause him, basically to hate Shaykhun. There's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. He doesn't have a cause. He doesn't have a cause, or else you're stuck in infinite regress. This is how the Quran wants to reason with people. So if you're a Muslim educator, a professor, a chaplain, a teacher, from graduate school to Sunday school, it is your duty to say to our young people, Sadaq Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks the truth. Fatili rumillah to Ibrahim Hanifa. Follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the archetypal monotheist. Edward Lane says in his famous lexicon that ittiba', which means following our adherence, and one of the meanings of this is to imitate, imitate Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, la tabtakh, la tabtakhu khutwati shaitan. Don't follow the footsteps of Satan, fa innahu yakhuru bin fahshai wa muntar. For he calls to perversity and falsehood. So these words have meanings, normative definitions. <coughs> they are defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah. The Quran is theologically and morally judgmental. And we must be prepared with reason to defend those judgments, even if people have discounted reason. Continue to be reasonable. It is reason that makes us human, <coughs> according to our philosophers. If we are a rational animal, it is our differentia, it is what makes us distinctive. Continue to use reason, engage in dialectic with people. Don't engage in a type of rhetoric. Don't try to change opinions based solely on emotion. We have to appeal to logic. This is very, very important. Now, the literary method of postmodernists, I don't have a lot of time, just bear with me. The literary method is called deconstructionism. According to deconstructionism, no one interpretation of a text, such as a religious text, should be privileged over other readings. They love this word, privilege. The social sciences aside, even the hard sciences are feeling the pressure of postmodernism. There was a French feminist philosopher who said that, I'm not making this up, she said the equation E equals MC squared is sexist because it privileges the speed of light over other speeds. Apparently, there are now also an infinite number of genders. Reason and scripture say there are two, X, Y, and X, X, but now we are told by social scientists, college professors, and Facebook that people who maintain this rigid binary are just bigots. This is Ajib and Gharib. A great American Muslim scholar once said, Shaitan wants to change the thawabit into mutabayarat. He wants to change the immutables into mutables. So there are classic laws of thought, such as the principle of identity, the principle of non-contradiction. So male is male, and not male is not male. There are 3,500 biological differences between men and women. It is not purely a social construct or a feeling. 
If you're a man, putting on your grandmother's shoes doesn't make you into an old woman any more than barking like a dog makes you into a dog. This is very, very strange. We consider these things axiomatic, but all of these things are being called into question. It's very, very strange what's happening. It's a zoo out there. People can't handle it. It is Satan who wants to blur the lines of gender. This is why, and I won't say it, the, the, the official symbol of the Church of Satan is androgynous, because he, sh he shatters the gender binary, as it were. So according to deconstructionism, meta-narratives, that is to say, standard interpretation, standard tafsir of text is totally rejected. All readings are valid and equally important, they say. What is only demanded is to be interesting. In other words, as long as it's entertaining, as long as it feels good. So now we have in religious departments and seminaries all around the world a method of textual interpretation called radical hermeneutics. Queer hermeneutics, transgender hermeneutics, third wave feminist hermeneutics, neo-Marxist hermeneutics. It is a zoo out there. The quest for truth or the intended authorial meanings of a text are totally abandoned. Rather sacrificed upon the altar of self-interest and feelings. So grammar, logic, rhetoric, syntax, definition, consistency, context, who cares? Scripture now bends to accommodate us, not us to accommodate it. Rather than interrogating our own positions in light of Scripture, we interrogate Scripture in light of our own positions. In short, Scripture can now mean whatever we want it to mean, according to them. The Prophet said, there will come a time and nothing will remain of this religion. Nothing will remain of this religion except its name. It's just going to be a name without a reality, a nomen without an essence. And nothing will remain of this Quran, except this script, this words on a page, deprived of its meanings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq. Because people out there, it's, there's an increase in, uh, in uh, apostasy, an increase in, in depression, in despair. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to give people hope, give people a sense of purpose, give people a sense of a goal. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, Speak the truth even if it's bitter. And don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of people. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People need an alternative to this madness. Everything is being questioned. The very foundations are being shaken apart. But we have to stay firm. Istiqama, just like Imam al said, Istiqama is the greatest miracle. It's greater, he said, he said, Ahmad al Rifai, he said, if you see a man flying through the air, walking on the water, don't believe in him. Unless you see his istiqama, his uprightness to the religion. A man came to the Prophet, give me advice. He said, uh, uh, Qul billah. Say, I believe in Allah. Thumaskatim, and be firm and upright upon that. This is the greatest miracle. Abu'l-Mawi had that.